Welcome to Contra Costa Library's um, Women's History Month. Today we're kicking off our interviews with changemakers in the Bay Area, uh, women changemakers that are changing the lives of people in the Bay Area and history. And I, I couldn't think of anybody better than inviting uh, Caroline Fetterman to be with us today and talk with us. Caroline, welcome. Caroline, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Dean. I um, just want to start off with a, a kind of a commercial, if you will. Um, I'm going to be um, sharing my screen. Well, let me just do a slideshow really quickly. So the Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with your resources, services, and materials at all 26 of our branches. Access to more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections and thousands of digital materials 24 seven at cccLIB.org. I'm gonna just uh, go ahead and change. Visit any library and use our public computers, printers and free Wi-Fi. You can also visit one of our branches with laptops for on-site use for checkout of Wi-Fi hotspots for three weeks. Contra Costa County Library is adult literacy program and trains and supports volunteer tutors and delivers basic literary instruction for adults throughout the county. And so much more. There's so many programs and wonderful things going on. I can't even count them all. It just makes me dizzy thinking about it all. Visit our website and sign up for our digital library card today. And then that's it. I am um, done with that portion. Okay. And let's see. All right. And we will end the slideshow now. All right, we're going and we're back to uh, normal now. Okay, great. So today I'm talking to Carolyn Fetterman, who is the founder of the Charlie Carr Project, a national nonprofit that provides tools and curriculum for food education in schools. Carolyn has worked in food education for more than a decade, leading Alice Waters Edible Schoolyard Project, consulting on policy and program development for the Jamie Oliver Foundation, co-founding the Berkeley Food Institute, producing UC Berkeley's edible education course with Michael Pollan and more. Carolyn, welcome to the pod. Uh, welcome to the program. I almost said podcast. <laughs> Does everyone know that you do a podcast too, Dean? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But if uh, they'd like to, they can go on Spotify or Instagram and uh, listen to me on the Well Season Librarian podcast. Everything cookbooks and libraries. Yeah, we got it. we got it covered. We do a little bit of everything. For our listeners who might not be familiar with you, can you talk a bit about where you grew up, where you went to school? Um, sure. So I grew up in Northern California, and I actually I started uh, college at. Boston University, but then I transferred to UC Berkeley. And I've mostly been here in the Bay Area ever since. And it was really nice to come back to Berkeley and be able to build a life and raise my children here. You've worked with Alice Waters at the Edible Schoolyard Project for many years. I'm a fan of this project, and I'd love to hear you talk about this for our listeners who, are, who may not have heard of it. Hopefully, Folks in the Bay Area are familiar with Alice Waters and some of her work that um, Restaurant Chez Panisse. So she's a restaurateur. The restaurant is has been around for 50 years. Um, and she was really the progenitor of the um, farm to table movement and and um, also a, a huge influence on farm to school. So she started a program called the Edible Schoolyard, which is a kitchen garden and a kitchen classroom on the campus of a middle school in Berkeley. And when um, I worked with Alice, the, the program was already 20, roughly 20 years um, mature. And I could see the influence that that program was having on the children of Berkeley and the students that came through the program. It's incredibly powerful and influential to have kids cook and um, harvest fresh food as part of their academic day. And that's what that program does. 
Now, I, I got to ask about this because I love this guy. You worked with a British celebrity food star, Jamie Oliver, for a time. I'm a huge fan of his. I like just not only his cooking show and his cookbooks, but I also love the work he's done to increase awareness of uh, education uh, about nutrition in schools. Can you talk about your time with uh, Jamie Oliver? Sure. Um, so, Jamie, I I met the Jamie Oliver Foundation and that crew when I was working with Alice, and then they hired me to work on a program when he won the TED Prize. And how it works when you, it, it used to be when you win the TED Prize that the TED organization would put together a big group of advisors to help you achieve whatever your TED Prize dream was. And um, so he wanted to change school lunch and he wanted to change school lunch here in the States. and. So they brought together this big group of people that worked on messaging and um, advertising and program and kind of ran the gamut. And it was a really, really interesting project. And then you may recall that he did a television show where he was he and his team went to Huntington, Virginia and worked in one school um, trying to improve the offering of the school lunch and educate the kids about the food that they were being served and and what some options were. So, um, you know, it was a really interesting time working with them. And I did some work with them in LA also on um, removing chocolate milk from the school food system. And one of the things I really took away from that experience is that it's important when you're working with folks that they, that the idea comes from them, that they are feel invested and committed. When you decide you want to accomplish something in a place and you go there and bring the idea, it it sometimes brings up a lot of friction and it's not the most, it's not the most successful method. So um, I really um, took that to heart. And so we've applied that a lot at Charlie Card and we, uh, part of the reason that we charge for the program is because we want to be sure that folks are invested and they've got some skin in the game and they feel committed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one thing to like, you know, when you want to give information to people and help them out. I think the approach is the most, I think, isn't that like the hardest part of the whole thing? Like, I, I know that if I were to come in and say, oh, I have some different way for you guys to do something anywhere people are immediately be like, what do you mean? Like, take right, nobody out. likes that. People yeah. don't, you know, even if you call them and say, hey, we want to do this. And they say, okay, sure. That sounds good. It's, it's always so much better if people come to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, I think the, the whole thing with food school lunches has always been very difficult. I, that's a huge mammoth uh, hurdle. I think it's incredibly bureaucratic and complicated it is it's just a it's a system in itself that doesn't have a lot of transparency and um it's it's really difficult to work in school food yeah we um really don't give enough credit to the to the folks that run the school nutrition programs and and are trying to make a difference every day for so many kids and they're just kind of getting beaten down at every turn. There's a lot of bureaucracy. I mean, I have a lot of kids at home and uh, my kids only eat like four things each, I think. <laughs> so I can't, I, I, my hat goes on to anybody who's like working in a program that's feeding them because my kids, it's not mac and cheese, forget it. <laughs> what are the four things? Mac and I cheese. Think is one of them. Mac and cheese, uh, sugar, um, chocolate and uh, French fries. I think that's the four <laughs> things. You got to send them over to me. <laughs> send, uh, please send them over to Carolyn's cooking school. Take my kids, please. You are instrumental in helping to found the Berkeley Food Institute. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? That's something I'm very excited about hearing about. Sure, that was a, a lot of fun too. That was um, well. Let's see. We had been working on the. 40th anniversary of Chez Panisse restaurant. And as part of that, we wanted to do a series of lectures. And uh, we sat down with uh, Michael Pollan and um, and we 
pitch to this idea of doing a series of lectures and that turned into the edible education course. And then in the process of that, uh, I realized working closely with UC Berkeley that there was not a food institute on campus. And I did some research about what institutes are and how they work on campus. And so then um, I pitched that to him and he put me in touch with a funder who was trying to get something going on campus, but was thinking about just funding a, a chair, um, a professor. And so um, we worked together and we found the right department to house the Food Institute and convinced them um, and they got excited about it. And then we um, went out to some funders and kind of drafted a blueprint for what this could look like. And, um, you know, it was it all happened really quickly that we were able to bring in the seed money to, to get it going. Yeah. And that led to the Edible Education 101 course at UC Berkeley? Yeah, Paul. it was a little bit opposite. The Edible Education course was first, um, and it was in the process of doing that course with Michael Pollan that I, that I realized that there was not really a food presence on campus, which is, didn't make any sense to me since Berkeley is such, is known for food and UC yeah. Berkeley is so progressive and it seemed, and UC Davis had food program and yeah. MU had a food program and BU has a food program. And I didn't understand why Berkeley didn't have a food program. And I was thinking that the, the Food Institute would house a minor at a minimum, maybe a major. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, maybe some kind of work where you work with all those policy folks and help them um, or the work with the scientists and help them translate their research into policies of combining the resources on campus, like the, the, the you know, the law school and the, um, and the agriculture students and all of those people combine together and help them make the most of their work in collaboration. So that's, that, that was kind of the vision for it. That's really beautiful. I love that. In 2015, you founded the Charlie Cart Project. This has been a really phenomenal program across the United States. We have, um, for our listeners who are listening now um, or watching this, we have a Charlie Cart program at El Cerrito Library in Contra Costa County. So we are actually involved in the Charlie Cart program. Um, you founded this in 2015. Can you tell our, our watchers? Um, a little bit about this um, program and what it does. Uh, yes, absolutely. I um, so just as some context, I was teaching cooking in my kids' school. So my kids were also raised in Berkeley, but before they were at the middle school where the edible schoolyard is, um, they didn't really have kitchen garden programming. So I would go once a month or so to their schools and teach cooking in their classrooms. And I saw how difficult that was to bring all of the equipment and kind of get it set up. And especially if you're just doing it by yourself, it's a lot of lugging and then bringing everything back and throwing it in your dishwasher. It was a lot, quite a bit of work. And I thought if I had something that I could use to house all of the stuff that I would have probably done that more frequently. The other thing I noticed was that even here in Berkeley, where we're so food focused and food conscious, a lot of the kids, I was m mainly making salads. I would make a seasonal salad in the classes. And um, a lot of the kids had never tasted lettuce before, carrots, things that we really take for granted. And um, and that came as a surprise, but also what came as a surprise that they would ask for seconds and thirds of everything. So either they were really hungry or they actually really liked it or maybe both. Um, so I thought, okay, this is, this is a powerful program. And I had obviously seen that in my work at the Edible Schoolyard, but it's a little different at the Edible Schoolyard because those kids are so attuned to it already. They're really getting um, full immersion. So. I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could 
instead of having to bring kids to a kitchen, if you could bring a kitchen to the kids, you know, it'd just be a little bit easier for the teachers to get involved and maybe potentially more accessible for schools that couldn't build out a full kitchen classroom. So that got me started thinking about um, founding Charlie Card. And there were a few other things that happened that kind of, it was a confluence of events that inspired me to, to do it. But um, one of the designers who actually worked with me on the Berkeley Food Institute and helping come up with the name and the logo and things for the Berkeley Food Institute, I called him. I knew he was really interested in food and he had a child in the Berkeley school system. And um, that's Brian Doherty from Celery Design. And I asked him um, if he would be willing to take a crack at designing a, a little mobile kitchen. And he did, he designed the Charlie card. And as you can see, he did such a beautiful job. He has a great aesthetic and he designed something really, really nice. And one of the things I told him, um, and that we, I think he and I really share this value is that kids, I feel like kids, deserve the best that we can possibly give them. And so often they don't get that, you know, especially in schools where everything has to be the lowest bidder and they get things that are subpar or maybe not very attractive. And I thought, let's make something really beautiful. And he did. I mean, he did such a great job because I mean, I, I work in libraries where we get things sometimes that are not really necessarily user friendly. People may have the best intentions. Like I've worked in libraries not this one, but others where the designer didn't really know anything about libraries or schools or whatever. And so that, so you're using something that was not really, it, the intention was good, but it's not really great. On the other hand, you have this where it is really well done. What was some of the thoughts they had when uh, this was being created? Thank you for that compliment. Um, so we, so, you know, Brian designs, uh, backwards he calls it designing backwards you know really by putting yourself in the place of the user so we had a lot of conversations with educators and a lot of conversations together and then a lot of trial and error about is this actually easy to use is this going to work in a classroom environment uh what happens when you turn around and you have your back to people what you know we thought through every single piece of it to make it as analog and simple as possible and then in writing the and you know the, the other two components of it are just how we filled it up with stuff so that took a lot of trial and error as well creating that kit of equipment and figuring out what are the most important foundational pieces of cooking equipment that need to be in something like this but then limiting and editing that set so it can fit in this rolling cart and um, and then ensuring you still can accomplish many recipes with that set of equipment. So that took a lot of, again, trial and error and thinking um, and talking to chefs. And we talked to many, many experts. Brian made me sets of cardboard drawers that I could fill with equipment and test how things fit. And there was a lot of that. That took many, many, many months. <laughs> and then we wrote the curriculum to further really lay it out for everyone so that it was absolutely clear here's what you need when you're making a lesson and here's how you turn this thing on and again just with the goal of making it as simple as possible for a stretched and stressed educator to to use how is a trolley cart used in a typical day like uh, uh, give me an example of what they would be doing with the trolley cart when they're using it so um, it can either be used by the teacher or a specialist or a librarian, or uh, maybe it's a parent volunteer and they roll the cart into the classroom. It's um, it's small, five by um, uh, five by two. So, it, and it rolls around easily. So you roll it into the classroom and you might set up three stations in the classroom or in the um, area where you're using it so that you have three different tables of participants. And then if you could imagine that maybe there's butcher paper on those tables, so they look like workstations. Yeah. And then you would put, um, it comes with cutting mats. So you put the cutting mats out. So you're then creating uh, basically like a prep station or a kitchen out of that room. And it, the room is then transformed and people who come in 
feel differently about the space. They kind of have some visual cues about how they're supposed to uh, behave or what they can expect. And then the teacher would have prepared the ingredients and some trays of equipment and ingredients for each station. And they would talk through what they were gonna make that day. So say they were making um, um, tamale pies. Tamale pies are a recipe on the Charlie cart. And so they have the ingredients, they have the masa and they have maybe some limes and some cheese. And then, and then after the, the instructor has talked through some introduction and given the theme for the lesson, if whether that be math or science or a special cooking technique, or maybe it's a cultural lesson, then they, they talk about that. And then they put all the equipment and ingredients on each table with the recipe and they guide the participants through actually preparing that recipe. And then they put it in the oven, everybody hangs out while it's cooking and then they sit down and eat it together. That sounds really fun. I think it is really fun. Yeah. The program is very prolific all over the country. Um, I was really loving doing the research for this because I got to see the different places that um, it's being used. And I was talking to somebody, I think on Twitter and they're on the other side of the country. And I, I, I can't remember, I think it was North Carolina maybe. And they're talking, well, yeah, we got our Charlie cart. And I'm like, they were so excited, like really excited. And it's really all over the place. The last count that I saw was 324 sites that's that's really impressive. I hope I don't know if that's accurate or if it's even increased by this since then. But did you ever envision that this would be so successful all over the place? We're at about four hundred sites now, and we're growing oh. at about a hundred to four hundred five a year. Yep, yep. Wow. Yep. I know it's crazy. Did that I is... envision? I guess probably not. To be honest, yeah, I didn't really think that far in advance. But it's really exciting and it is really fun to see these places that you would just wouldn't expect. And, and, and I've been so fortunate to be able to travel to some places. So last year, last fall, I went to um, uh, I went to Alaska and wow. we went to um, a fairly remote area of Alaska. Um, a town called Toke, and that was so much fun. And they have two Charlie carts, one in Toke and one in a village about an hour from Toke called Tetlin. And these places are about three hours drive from Fairbanks. So you can imagine they're 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 close to the Yukon. And it's a place where it, it drops to 85 below in the winter. Oh. <laughs> and it's just amazing to see them cooking with the Charlie cart. And and it's also so lucky, I feel I feel so lucky to have the opportunity to go there and visit and have a good reason to visit and uh, was just and they hosted us and they were amazing and we met these great people and saw all the incredible things they're doing and it's just really uh, it's really a privilege. Yeah. When did you get the epiphany to think of Charlie Carr? What where, when did that come to you? Um. There was a moment, there was a moment I was, I was at a conference, the Oxford um, Symposium on Food and Cookery. Have you been to that conference, Dean? No, but it sounds wonderful. Yeah, it's right up your alley. You should definitely go. Yeah. <laughs> it's at Oxford University and it's a, more or less, it's a food anthropology conference. It's small and intimate and they always have great food and the sessions are so fascinating and there was a woman from boston unit university kiri clayflin a, a professor who was doing a presentation on um well it was called trench fair so it was about eating in world war one eating during the war the the um not the civilians, but the soldiers. Yeah. yeah. And she showed these sepia print photos of this rolling kitchen from World War One France. And the the soldiers were marching alongside it and had this really tall stove pipe and I, I thought, and those giant wagon wheels. And I thought, oh my God, that looks like they're probably making cassoulet in there, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they, were, they probably were right on the way they probably were they probably were on their way to you know and then she showed a picture of them in the trenches and they had so french they had a little table set out with a uh, um a tablecloth and two little metal chairs and a, a vase in the center of the table <laughs> so i just was so inspired by that the castle mobile and i thought okay we need that is what we need we need a little rolling kitchen so let's make one <laughs> now that the program has been running for eight years how how what have you seen happen how has it changed over the last eight years um how has it changed that is a good question what we first really designed this for schools but almost immediately realized that there were so many other kinds of agencies that were gonna um take advantage of this so that was an interesting change it did come about right at the beginning that that we started working closely with libraries and then we got calls from clinics and universities and uh, very wide variety of organizations. So one of the things I would say has changed in the last two years is that we've decided to focus more closely on some of those particular partners, food banks, libraries, and schools, um, because we find that the partnerships within communities between those organizations can be incredibly generative and fruitful and that it helps to have an outsider come in and help facilitate those connections while the folks on the ground say what they want and they are the ones who have to do the work sometimes they're just busy working in their silos and it does take like an outside perspective to say hey why don't you connect and we've seen that be really effective so that's one change that the programming side of charlie cart has grown and is becoming more impactful. Have you had any um, feedback through the years from people that have like um, young people who have used it as like one of the recipients of, of it or have you worked, talked to any of the instructors or librarians that utilized it and gotten feedback about it? Yes, we talk to a lot of our network members. We don't talk to a lot of kids who have been um, beneficiaries of being part of a cooking program, but that is definitely next on our list where we're actually trying to create some tools to help the educators solicit those kind of stories and testimonials from kids because that's where the impact is that we really need to see, right? Yeah. Um, we do hear from educators a lot, how excited they are, how some folks say that it changed their career track. Some say that it's changed the um, programming at their organization. There's all kinds of great feedback. Yeah. Um, I also want to mention um, for those who are watching this um, program, um, we have links to Charlie Cart Project in the uh, chat. So you can go to that uh, when you want. So save it for later and look at it later too. Um, I want to talk about your cookbook. You wrote a wonderful cookbook for kids aged eight and up called New Favorites for New Cooks, 50 Delicious Recipes for Kids to Make. Tell us about how you came to write the book. Well, I had written the Charlie Cart curriculum and that was pretty tough writing that. And so I figured that I could just turn it into a book and I would take it to a publisher and say, hey, can you just turn this into a book? <laughs> I didn't realize how naive that was. <laughs> so I, um, I did, I took it to 10 speed and um, I worked with Jenny Wapner, who is amazing. And she's, she's no longer with 10 speed, but she's been publishing cookbooks for many, many years. She's a total expert. She also has kids of her own. So she understands from the insider perspective. And, um, and so she helped me turn it into a book and, it was a little bit painful. <laughs> Writing a book is hard. It's yeah, hard. No, it is. Yeah, yeah. Everybody I know that does that says like having a baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, in creative processes, you you get to, you, you kind of have that honeymoon phase where it's all really exciting and fun. 
And then you crash and you think, I don't know why I tried to do this. This is such a bad idea. It will never work. And everything about this is horrible. And then you kind of go through that tunnel. And if you keep going, then you emerge on the other side and things kind of start to come back together. Uh, and I have found that in almost every single creative process I've ever been part of. So, um, so I wasn't totally surprised when that happened, but it was hard. Yeah. True to form, a 10 speed press produced a beautiful cookbook, but this one, uh, the food photography was exemplary. Did you have some hand in that or choosing who would do that? Uh, thank you. I did choose the photographer. I absolutely love her work. Aubrey Pick. She's done a ton of cookbooks. She's so talented. Um, she, after, shortly after that, she opened her own studio. She's doing all kinds of great stuff. Um, she does Chrissy um, Teigen's books. And I mean, she does tons of great stuff. She's, she's talented and fun and um, lovely. Yeah. What was the recipe uh, like process writing for you? Uh, did you kind of test it out on your family and stuff? <laughs> yes, my poor children. <laughs> they had to eat things like 25 times in a row because I would just make it and make it and make it and make it um, over and over and over again with a little tweak here, or a little tweak there. And I'm not a um, very precise person. So I would sometimes, so, you know, as you go, you kind of tweak this and you tweak that. And I'd sometimes forget what I tweaked or forget to write it down. And then I would have to do it all over again. And so they yeah. ate, you know, luckily their friends were game. And so their friends came over and they always ate whatever I made and it was great. But there was lots of days where there were trays and trays of this and trays and trays of that. Yes. And then we, um, I did have two different chefs go through every single recipe. Um, so I had someone with a sort of salty palate and then somebody with a sweet palate. And then I kind of found the middle ground. <laughs> I put a link to this in the, um, the chat. But I, you know, I know it's listed as a kid's. Um, I thought there was a lot of good recipes in it, really solid stuff. I actually uh, like trying a few of them too. And I, I think it's like, it would be good for adult cooks too, that, like for kids that aren't like for adults that are learning to cook and may not be, you know, very savvy, like could take this and really do well with it. So I think it's a really great book and I Thank highly so recommend much. it. And Thank you. Can you. Get it through I, Contra Costa Libraries. <laughs> I should say too that, um, the, the, another reason that the photos looked so good was uh, that there's a stylist who does, you know, I don't know if you know this about the process, but a stylist prepares the recipes, but um, what I didn't realize, so I thought I was going to have to cook all the recipes for the photographer, but the stylist prepares the recipes, which is so nice because it takes a lot of pressure off. Um, yeah. And they, and the stylist is George DeLeith, and he does a ton of work in the Bay Area um, for cookbooks, for William Sonoma, for all kinds of things. And he's just incredible. And not only is he um, just a really kind person, but he would he's so precise and he would make the recipe and then he would give you notes so we could then go back. It was like a third check on the recipe. We could go back wow. and make final edits. Yeah, it was amazing. And he made everything look so yummy. Carolyn, what's next for you? <laughs> uh, more Charlie Cart. More Charlie Cart is next. We're gonna um, we're gonna keep going. We're at forty seven states, and that little competitive part of me wants to be in fifty states, even though it's not important. I still do want to have that. And um, and then we're going to continue developing our program and. Um, our team is going to go out there and meet with our sites and interview them and highlight their work and share it with you. That sounds wonderful. I know a lot of uh, schools and libraries are going to be very happy to get those too. So I'm, ha I'm looking forward to seeing you hit 500, 600 or more. Thank you, Dean. I want to open it up to questions. I'm going to let allow people to talk. If you want to go ahead and ask questions, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Anybody have any questions? Just go right ahead.
Do you have any questions, Dean? Maybe I should ask you some questions. You can ask me questions. Tell us what you do at the library. I um, work with programming and I um, develop programs like uh, Chess Club and we have a needle needle craft um, program coming up. Um, I have a uh, writing program for teens. We have an anime club. We have a pop-up library. We take over to a local uh, senior community uh, next to us and a whole lot more. Do a lot have of things. You, have you taught on the Charlie cart yet? No, I want to though. I would like to have um, my library get one. That was kind of one of my things I'm hoping to angle for. Because I think the local schools would really love that. I think it would really do well for this area. Yeah, the Berkeley Public Library has, um, they use it a lot, but they have a new teen room. So they use it a lot with their teens and then they wheel it out in front of the library and they serve hot chocolate, chili, warm things on cold days. And to the teens who are on, right on their way to high school, it's really sweet. I think that, I think we have a, a huge amount of teens that pass by. We have a high school right across. So I think that'd be wonderful. I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. Maybe this uh, this video will help that happen. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, go ahead, please. I do have a question for you, Carolyn. Um, for people out there sort of trying to improve or get, get kids to eat more vegetables, maybe, what is the gateway vegetable that you feel like is kind of the way to hook kids into trying more things? Oh, that is such a great question, Jackie. Uh, a gateway vegetable. Okay, well, I'm gonna say, this is gonna sound, well, okay. <laughs> I would say the simplest is um, snap peas because kids, they're so sweet and kids really love them. But um, the thing that worked for my oldest was bok choy. And it is because it's also really sweet. And it's something that I think people might not think of, but when you steam it and you can put sauce on it or a little vinegar or nothing, it's incredibly sweet. And it's got such a nice texture because it's soft, but it's also a little bit crunchy. And um, I think one of the important things, and actually I learned this from Alice Waters is to wait until the kids are hungry and feed them something like that when they're hungry so they're less likely to reject it because they're hungry and so instead of filling them up on crackers or um, something like that you then you have your your vegetables at the ready and snap peas are simple too because kids can bring them in their lunch and they can kind of play around with it it has a lot of little components and you can see the little peas sleeping in their beds inside and kids love things like that yeah so that's my long-winded answer to a great question. That. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, feel free to just jump right in. Okay. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I'll go ahead and end it here. Um, but Carolyn, I've really been happy to talk to you. And I really um, appreciate you being here for uh, Women's History Month. It meant a lot to me to have you as a guest because I really feel like you do so much for, you know, the earth and, you know, the United States, California, Bay Area, you do so much for us all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. All right. Well, I'll end this now.